Okay, I think we got just to start our webinar. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on cyber threat landscape and insurance sector perspective. I'm Maria Hadran, I will be your host for today. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that you have joined in a listening mode only. So please use message facility to raise any questions, which we will answer at the end of the session. And today our guest is Nathan Hankin, um, a senior cyber broker with an A on the cyber theme. Uh, Nathan, he has 14 years of experience in commercial insurance, helping organizations across many industries of all sizes, from startups to global organizations. Nathan has presented at many cyber-focused events across the country. He also offers help and insight around cyber risk and real-life examples or media to help educate colleagues and the clients. Uh, Nathan is also Certificate in Information Security Management Certified, and he has also achieved his Certificate in Insurance with the Chartered in Insurance Institute. So welcome, Nathan. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. And nice to be here. Brilliant. So what we're going to do, I will stop sharing my screen and I will allow you to pull your presentation. Yeah, no problem at all. And you should have an option to. Yep. Yeah, all good. Thank you. There you go. It should and be F5. Sorry, there we go. Brilliant. Right. So, hi, everyone. My name's Nathan Hankin. Um, thank you for the introduction. That was spot on. Um, so, basically, I am Aeon's cyber nerd. Um, so, when it comes to all of this, this is who they get on calls um, and to talk about the threats and landscape. Now, when we put this session together a few months ago, it was my full intention to talk about the insurer's view on cyber, but actually I thought it'd be quite interesting to flip it round and actually give you an insight to what our clients and other insurance clients view as the main cyber risks. So um, what I thought I would do, first of all, is just talk about the cyber stats on a global basis. So there is a website called itgovernance.co.uk, fantastic website, really keeps you up to date on all the news trends, shows you updates on data breaches and so forth. And it is a really good open free source material for you to use. So what I thought we would do is just go over the top stats. So number of incidents in October so far, 114 reported. Now reported is very important because there will be organizations out there that don't report their data breaches or their cyber attacks. Um, number of breached records in October, 867 million. Number of incidences in 2023 reported, 953 so far. A number of breach records in 2023, 5.3 billion. Absolutely insane. And that number keeps growing year on year. The biggest data breach of to record so far was for a firm called Darkbeam, and that leaked 3.8 billion out of that 5.3 billion records. And the biggest data breach in the UK so far, and probably with the biggest repercussions for ourselves, is the Electoral Commission. Uh, with 40 million breached records. Um, that whole scenario is very interesting. What I haven't done today is pulled out all the newsworthy stories that you've probably all read about. So you've probably all looked at the Electoral Commission. How does that affect you? How does that affect your local area? You know, how what implications does that have? Uh, same thing with the police uh, in Ireland, haven't gone through that story and any other of the big ticket items, because I thought you probably know. So here today, I'm going to try and teach you about the things that you may not know or may not have heard about. So just to touch on the three biggest data breaches. Um, so of October, they were all listed there. The idea of this slide deck today is to give you something that you can take away and that you can look at in your own time or you can take back to the office and share with people. So I've just put them across in three silos just so you can see the amount of records that have been affected and the name of the individuals. But again, I won't go into detail about them. What I did find interesting was when looking at the IT governance breakdown of October, with the top four sectors that have been affected and most likely everybody on this call. Um, so healthcare was at number two with 27% of the incidences. Education was number three and joint four, believe it or not, public or non-profit organizations. This is the real reason why you are here today is to try and understand cyber risk. What does it mean? What can you do to mitigate it? And how much of a serious issue is it? 
Well, if you think that the majority of you are in the top four of the sectors to be affected, um, it's clearly a big issue. So Aon put together every couple of years a cyber resilience report. So I thought I would share with you today some of the key findings and actions. But when I read some of the results, I'm going to show you on the flip side what insurers are looking for or why it's important from an insurance standpoint. Now, it is also important to an organization, regardless whether it's about insurance or not, because it will still feed into your risk transfer and risk understanding. So to advise on how we collected this information, and by no way do I want you to read all this because it'll take you forever, <laughs> um, we have something called a PsyQ. So basically it's a self-evaluation that clients can fill, fill in and complete, and it will give uh, our clients an overview of what their IT security looks like. It's uh, based on the NIST framework, which is from the States, and basically it scores you from zero to four. Doing so gives you an idea of four being brilliant, zero being in your infancy, or you don't have those controls in place. It really gives an organization an understanding of where they are and need to get to in order to be safe um, or to obviously reduce the ability to be attacked. Now, the PsyQ assessment was collected by 2,946 unique reports this year, so great field, um, and that was across um, the globe as well. So it does mention some of the countries there and some of the places, so you can obviously see oh, Australia, UK, EMEA, et cetera, et cetera. So just to touch on cyber um, resilience and just what it looks at and what it what does it actually mean so we've tried to create something called this cyber loop and effectively it shows that no matter where you start your cyber journey it will all loop into each other eventually but what i wanted to show you today is obviously the increased frequency and severity of incidences leading to rising costs of insurance and to organizations as well cyber resilience is the number one public sector risk and um, so we have done reports and fancy, you know, funny enough, and it's not just public sector where cyber is number one, it's the majority. Um, but we tried to break it down a little bit further and show you what do you actually need to think about. So you need to unite stakeholders. A lot of people just think cyber is an IT issue. It is not. It is a board issue. It's a legal issue. It's a marketing issue. It's a PR issue. It's HR, because if you needed to hire extra people to manage phones or pick up phones to deliver messages or keyboards, it's a HR issue. Where are you getting those people from? Where are you sourcing them from and so forth? It's an operations issue. It is an everybody issue. And I think the most important stakeholder is to date the day-to-day -day employees. So it is very important that you do carry out training, that you do do phishing training, that you can spot a fake email or a dodgy link and you are not giving away your username or password. So that message is the number one message that we need to get across because no matter how sophisticated a system is, no matter how much you spend, People are the issue of cyber, not computers and systems. What you also need to think about is assessing and quantifying that risk. What does it look like for your authority? What does it look like for your organization? These things cost millions of pounds to resolve. And it's the longevity of a claim that you really need to think about. So I always treat cyber like a play. There's three acts. In Act 1, you've got your first party costs and your immediate loss. So thinking about IT forensics to fix it, PR to look after your reputation, and then legal um, to obviously deal with the ICO and everything else. And you're also going to have a financial impact to your organization, no matter what sector you are in. Act 2, we start thinking about those legal implications a bit more, and we start dealing with the information commission officer. We look at potential fines from them. We look at potential fines with other third parties that we may be contracted with. But the third part of the claim and the longevity and where it really takes its toll and you won't see it for three to five years after the event is in the event that any third parties want to claim against you for the loss of their data. So under GDPR, there is affirmative language that you can make a claim for emotional distress due to this data being lost. And we are seeing in the States massive class action lawsuits. And we are also seeing large numbers of individuals in the UK 
going to law firms to gain compensation from those individuals that have been affected. That will be no different from public sector. If people are affected, they have the right to claim and they will. They won't care that you haven't got the budget or anything else. We see claims made against public sector clients every day of the week. So this will be no different. With cyber resilience, you need to think about defining the objective. What are you actually trying to achieve? How are you going to get there? You know, if you know that X is an issue, how are you going to resolve that? Again, lack of funding being an issue. How can you get to that point? And then obviously the fourth and most important piece is prioritizing your spending on that. Do you want to spend more on the resilience piece? Do you want to spend more on the recovery piece? Do you want to spend, you know, X amount implementing MFA, which is a key control this year? Or do you want to do a few of the smaller controls um, to offer extra protection across that piece as well? So I'm only going to go through the key takeaways of this report. I will make sure that it's an attachment at the end when I send this presentation as well. So you can all read through it. But I thought I will only take the highlights um, out of the report. So. What I wanted to let you know from an insurance standpoint is that there has been increased underwriting rigor over the past couple of years. That's because insurers used to write these big limits for next of no, no premium with little understanding of what was around the corner in terms of sheer size and sheer cost of these potential claims. So now insurers, instead of offering 10 and 20 million pound limits for next to nothing, have now really drilled down. 5 million is generally the maximum they want to deploy. And it will cost in the region of 50 to 100,000 minimum for those type of limits. But it's the underwriting that is key because they need to understand all of these controls that you have in place. And again, from their perspective, they may need to manage their risk. So on average, organizations across the industries and revenue bands improved their cyber maturity from basic to managed, which is great, and the direction that we all need to move in going forward. Uh, data security, application security, remote work access control, and endpoint and system security demonstrated the most improvement in risk profiles. Now, what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll try not to use IT language because I'm sure many of you on the call won't understand what they are. But data security, how are you keeping those data records safe? Application security, the software that you use, how do you know it's updated? Remote work access, so can you log on to your emails from your phone or from your laptop at home outside of the organization? An endpoint could be a mobile phone, it could be a laptop, um, and system security is obviously everything just keeping that safe. Teams must constantly evaluate uh, an organization's preparedness for involving threats and provide quantifiable evidence of current control effectiveness. Now, another thing that I just want to mention uh, throughout this presentation, if you think it's a bit businessy, it probably is written in that style, but don't worry, I will make this relatable to you. So I just wanted to show you an example of what the report looks like so we all understand what we are talking about. So here we can see certain risk controls on the left-hand column. We can see 2020 scores from those clients that completed it, and we can see scores on 2022. Um, we can also see the changes, whether that's been positive or minus, but lucky enough, from a global perspective, everybody is improving. The industry score changes. Now, what is a shame is that many of our public sector clients don't actually complete or have this PsyQ process done as part of their offering with Aon. So we haven't actually got that much detail around. The only sector that we do have information on on the public sector call today is the education services. And we can actually see that there has been a small improvement in security overall, which is great because I'm sure many of you from the education sector will appreciate the amount of claims that have been in the news, whether that's been from the UK, whether that's been stateside, whether that's the theft of data, or whether that's the uh, theft of money from parents uh, on fees and other bits and pieces as well. Um, and the other thing as well, I don't usually include it within public sector, but of course it is a massive part, healthcare and social assistance. So we have even seen some interesting claims from nursing homes where people have taken pictures of the signing book at the door. Uh, and it's actually led to incidences and other police matters. Um, so 
homes have had to invest in iPads or tablets to keep that data secure. So it's a one step sign in that data is hidden, that data is secure. Um, so we've even seen little care homes affected by data breaches that you wouldn't even think would have occurred all those years ago. Um, healthcare globally is still massively targeted. It does tend to be out of the state side that it's very heavy on. Uh, that's because there's so many healthcare providers and they just can't provide that security. Um, but then again, I'm, I'm sure that there's probably a similar issue with our NHS trusts, that there isn't enough funding or that these projects do cost a lot of money and it takes a lot of time to implement. So just moving on to the second lot of insights, insider risk. So insider risk is someone inside your organization that may sell their credentials onto third parties. And you may ask who would do that. We don't know people as well as we think they do. Um, you know, we've seen CEOs and FDs carry out fraud against massive organizations and do it for a number of years really well. Um, and it's because they're in gambling debts, because they're living a lifestyle above their means and all of these things. Uh, we do still see people, especially in hard times now, sell their credential for thousands of pounds on the dark web to an organization, to hackers to allow them to carry out malicious attacks. The other type of insider risk that we also see as well is when an organization doesn't remove credentials when an employee leaves. And we have actually seen, obviously, if employees are terminated, then go back into the systems to try and steal data or, again, sell those on for hackers to cause more damage. Um, another key piece here, it says nearly half of all companies have not segregated their end-of-life software from application systems. End-of-life software is any software that is no longer supported by the original vendor. So it could be an old version of Microsoft. So it could be Microsoft 7 or Windows XP, you know, any of those uh, stories that you've heard previously. Um, and it basically means that they have known exploits on the internet that the hackers know how to take advantage of, how to put viruses on, etc. And they are connected to everything. The idea is that any end of life system should be segregated and away from main processes um, and protected. So two interesting stories. And again, the links will be in the notes when I send this across. But UK councils last year admitted to security failings um, in 2022. There was almost 1500 data breaches last year. And there was also 600 devices that were lost or stolen during the course of 2022. Again, if these devices aren't locked down in the proper manner, if they haven't got the antivirus or security on them, these devices could be breached and data stolen or worse, give hackers access into the third party organization. Um, a recent example that I just thought I would bring to light. So recently, a council has reported a data breach uh, joining a growing list of UK public sector organizations to have accidentally and illegally exposed, exposed sorry, sensitive files this year. And that's an important thing to point out. It's not always malicious. It can be an accident. We have a term in the cyber world of fat finger, and it basically just means that you've typed the wrong email address or you may have copied someone in accidentally uh, and sent that list out to people who shouldn't have been included on that list. For this particular um, council, the data breach occurred as a result of a mismanaged request under the Freedom of Information Act. The council uploaded a spreadsheet of what he thought contained solely anonymous rules and data. Uh, it later discovered that the spreadsheet was integrated personal and special category data of all current and former council staff uh, as of March the 31st. Uh, the document was initially uploaded on May the 17th and was locked with permission set to read only. The council became aware of the accidental data exposure on October the 27th. So that data has sat there for months, exposed out there. We don't know how many people have viewed it, although there may be a way to track it. Again, IT forensics can go in, how many people have logged into this website, how many views, how many clicks, etc. So they can identify that later on, but there will be a cost involved. Um, in total, more than 2,000 individuals were affected, 1,854 current staff and 276 former council workers were affected, and 169 office holders and canvassers and 55 councillors and courts members. So it just goes to show you it's not always malicious, it can be accidental as well. 
Um, some important stats again for data security and just to focus on some key areas. Data classification is something that organizations can do to easily identify public records or private records. Um, it does take time to implement. It does rely on employees tagging that data, um, but it is a really good control because when you report to the ICO and they ask you what data has been affected, not only will you have a record count, but you would also be able to identify quite easily whether that was a public or private document that could be shared with a third party. And it's good to see there's been a massive jump in user awareness and training because they are the key controls. Uh, for any of you on the call, whether you have an understanding of IT or not, multi-factor authentication is basically a secondary sign-in. So many of you will receive a text or have an app once you've used your username or password to get in your systems. Um, and another great example of this is your banking, online banking apps. So now when you make a payment, it asks you to go into your banking app and accept or confirm that that's you. That is multi-factor authentication. And a good training session you can do around Christmas is to get people to turn it on your Amazon, to turn it on your eBay accounts and everything like that. So when fraud is at its highest, you will be, I'll have that extra protection in place to stop hackers taking full advantage. That's why you need to make training uh, and awareness relevant to the individuals that you are speaking to. But it really is good. I mean, for the kids, if any of you use Uber Eats or Deliveroo, you now have to give a code at your door that is multi-factor authentication. That is a secondary form of authenticating who you are. So from operational risks, so critical controls perceived to be reduced the probability or severity of a ransomware event, which is the most important. A ransomware event is a virus that shuts down your whole entire system while stealing data. But sometimes you can receive written ransoms as a threat to carry that out um, as well. Um, but effectively, yeah, key controls here to disrupt operations are the focus of insurers and organizations as well, may I add. Um, we are starting to see that ransomware trends over the summer. There is a quiet period because guess what? All these gangs making millions also like to go and spend their money too. They want to be on a boat. They want to go drive their fast cars. Um, and in September alone, we just saw a massive increase in ransomware attacks again. Uh, the MGM Casino is a fa fascinating one. You can find loads of videos online, good four or five minute videos on YouTube, just talking about how that hack has happened. Somebody phoned up pretending to be an MGM employee that they found on LinkedIn and got them to reset their password, got the MFA authentication code and effectively went in and shut MGM down for about eight days. The estimated total loss so far is at $100 million. That's before any third party compensation or claims come in and before any fines and penalties are issued by any regulators or third parties. Reputational risk. Now, the next few slides focus on the business perspective, but I know that reputational risk is important to the public sector. And in previous reports, uh, reputational risk has been number one. That's been above anything else. How are we perceived? How are we looking after our town or city? you know, or our people or our clients. Reputational risk is a really important thing. You've spent years building, hundreds of years even in circumstances, building that reputation. It's how you deal with a claim or an incident that is really going to make or break you. And what you need to think about is what does our business continuity plan say? How can we recover? Do we have insurance to transfer the financial risk or are we going to have to take this on the chin? What I wanted to share with you, and again, I know it's business related, but I think it paints a really good picture. Our research identified that 17 companies that successfully navigated uh, a cyber attack uh, saw an average increase in the value of 18% above their market trends in their share value. This got them a combined gain of $445 billion, 17 organizations. But what I think this really highlights, I know you aren't all out for profit, that's not the point, but what this highlights is if you can succeed in really delivering a good message to all stakeholders, internal and external, you have everything in place, you pull that trigger and you're ready to go and it's really well managed, you can recover. 
you can still walk away with everybody's faith and trust in you as an organization. You can still keep your jobs because that's an important thing as well. Um, and actually, it can be a success story. Don't get me wrong. There are many organizations out there that aren't prepared. They don't have a business continuity plan that focuses on cyber. They haven't tested it. They don't know what retainers they need in place. And those organizations, unfortunately, will fail. But I know here, uh, well, at Aon, obviously, we speak to all of our clients about this. Whether people listen or not, <laughs> or implement those things is another thing. Because again, it takes time, it takes resource, it takes money, it takes practice. And it isn't always easy to do those things. But just like fire insurance, you'll be happy to have it in place when the building burns down and you know everything's okay. Um, so it does lead on quite nicely to bankruptcy and section 114. So obviously I know that in the news over the past couple of years, we've seen quite a few section 114s that have been issued for local councils uh, and other organizations. Um, the question for any FD on the call today and the question for everyone else to go back and ask the FD or the financial team today is if a cyber attack was to occur tomorrow, what provisions have we made on the balance sheet that would allow us the costs to get up and running again? Is there an agreed figure? Has this been spoke about? What have the board said? What direction have the board given? Because it's really important to understand, number one, how you quantify that. And number two, to make sure that if, you know, a council doesn't receive funding for the next two, three weeks through all of its usual means because it can't invoice, it can't chase, it can't release funds, it can't do anything because it can't access the data. What plans are in place and how do you financially recover from that? And that message is the same for any organisation, whether you are in healthcare or education or anything like that. You know, private schools, especially if you can't receive any of those fees or you can't chase them, you don't understand what's outstanding, you can't pay your teachers or anything of that issue or anything like that. Sorry. You know, how do you make sure that your teachers don't just go up and get up and leave? How do you make sure they don't go to another institution? How do you know that the students at the school um, will stay around? There was a really interesting development in the Manchester University um ransomware attack that they had hackers actually tried a triple extortion so single extortion you speak to the person direct double extortion you get them to pay a ransom to release the systems but then you charge another ransom not to release the data the triple extortion example was fascinating because the university said no nope, it's morally wrong to pay these ransoms we are not doing it the hackers said fine they emailed all of the students, the teachers, the previous students and teachers, and said, Manchester University doesn't care about you. They don't care about your data. They don't care about it being released. You need to stand up to them and get them to pay this ransom or else we're going to release this. And it was really the first time that we've seen the change in tactic of, well, if the organization isn't going to pay us and they don't care, we will go after the individuals that are affected and hopefully they can create such a situation that it forces the hand of the actual organization that's been affected. So hackers, again, are changing. They're changing with times. We have actually uh, witnessed them not necessarily locking down the systems as much now um, and just charging a straight ransom for the data because I understand times are hard. And I've actually seen that written in, <laughs> in, a, in a chat with a hacker you know, we appreciate times are hard. And if we were to shut your hotel down now, you know, we understand that you would lose out even more. You wouldn't be able to pay us because you've got nothing. So what we're going to do, we're just going to charge you a ransom for that and, yeah, go from there. So it was, it's really interesting to see their changing tactics as well. So supply chain risk, this is an important one. So whether you are buying in a product, whether you're relying on a service or anything of that nature, supply chain risk is a huge one that insurers are looking at currently, and I'm sure you all are as well. Um, what we also find at the moment is that it's not necessarily your network that is affected in the event of a cyber attack. It could be a third party. Um, one of the famous or the most famous and my favorite story is Target, uh, the shopping center in the United States. They were actually hacked through their air conditioning units. So what happened was hackers must have been walking around and thought, how do we get in here? How do we hack Target? It's massive. 
or they must have seen these big ventilation systems and they may have seen a sign or they may have known that they were looked after by a third party air conditioning unit company. So that third party were responsible for, they could see whether the uh, machines were at the right temperature, see if they needed any maintenance or anything else, but remotely all off site. So the hackers thought, well, why would I go after Target with all their really good security when they have access and I can just go after them? So the hackers gained access to the third party air conditioning unit company. They did indeed have network access into Target. They then installed a virus onto the point of sale card machines. And every time somebody scanned their card, those details were transmitted to the to the hackers. Um, I think it finished out about 50 to 70 million card details that were stolen. And obviously that was a huge claim because not only do you have all the first party costs, all the people whose data was stolen, you also have to pay the banks for the replacement of cards and the increased security. You're also paying Experian for credit monitoring services. Uh, and you have all those costs to think about as well. What this uh, report did point out is that only 46% of clients reported multi-factor authentication for third parties to log into their networks. So if that third party employee loses or sells his credential, being a username or password, they could have full access into your networks. So again, multi-factor authentication, the number one control that can really help save you in the event of a breach. Systemic risk, I think, again, is probably on all of your lists. Um, and effectively, a systemic risk is a large cyber attack that could wipe out the majority of the country, majority of clients, or something of that nature. We've seen a few of these attacks, non petcha back in uh, 2018, 2019. We've seen SolarWinds, which was a massive attack on a company which done updates for loads of other companies. Um, and most recently, Move It, which you may have been a victim of. The other large scale attack uh, is probably Civica. That's probably affected many of you uh, because it's affected clients all over. And it's basically the risk of the insurers is what we need to think about and try to limit is if Microsoft AWS or uh, Amazon Web Services was to be attacked and to affect millions of claims uh, or insured sorry what does that look like have we got enough money to pay for that and what do we need to do to try and help clients get back up and running some insurers such as chubb and beasley have actually started adding clauses that in the event of a widespread event and the clause is triggered we would guarantee two million out of five million pounds to every one of our clients because that way they can manage that risk and wouldn't go bankrupt. Whereas if they tried to just pay the full limits, it just wouldn't work and they may not have enough capital. Because remember, it's not just cyber attacks that are catastrophic risks. You've also got your fire, your earthquake, your flood, everything on a global basis. Um, so yeah, systemic risk is definitely something we're looking at and thinking about in the background as well. In the UK, it was unfortunate to see that actually in face of rising risk, overall client cyber maturity did decline in the UK based on the PsyQ reports that we had seen, which was a shame compared to the global averages that we saw was positive. Um, but whilst overall maturity declined, scores in some security domains did increase, which was good, suggesting an increase in investment in some areas at, at the expense of others. So again, when we touched on it at the beginning, it all comes down to funding. Do we fund those three controls over that big one or do we go for that big one and ignore those three smaller? Um, global trends do, tick, uh, do indicate that ransomware attacks are on the rise. And insurers are responding, demanding a focus on controls that are a critical part of the underwriting process. It wasn't just our report that said this, so I thought this is another one. And this is probably my favorite report as well, this Allianz Risk Barometer. So they do this every year, unlike the Aon that's what done every couple, Allianz put this out every year. So 85 countries took part, 2,700 odds, uh, people replied or responded organizations and this is what the top 10 looks like and when speaking to clients what I do like to do is start off with this and just say looking at this picture where do these risks sit on your risk register is cyber number one or is it in your top three 
for a lot of you, fire and explosion may actually be your number one because you think insuring the buildings is more prominent than actually insuring for the cyber risk. But actually, the odds of a commercial fire is 38,000 to one. And depending which cyber report you read or facts you're giving today, the odds of a cyber attack are one in three, one in four, one in five. Um, and it's understanding where all of these risks sit on your risk register. Um, but in addition for this report, uh, for cyber being number one, it was rated number one in 19 different countries. So again, there was about 84. So again, one in four roughly countries view cyber as a number one risk. Um, but it was also the biggest risk leading to a business interruption loss or an income loss. And it was also the most concerning for environmental, social and governance risk trends of the, of the ESG. So it really is important to go back to your board and say, look, let's get our risk register out. Let's have a look at these reports. Where do these trends and where do these risks sit? And are we comfortable that we've actually got this right? Um, some more fun stats and statistics. <laughs> um, so recent public cyber claims. Um, I wanted to share with you the government statistics report um, on the cybersecurity breaches 2023. So looking at the education sector, um, as you can see, there was a number of schools there that was uh, asked, so 241 primary schools, 217 secondary schools, 44 further educations and 52 higher. Out of that, 41% of primary schools have suffered some form of cyber attack, 63% of secondary schools, 82% of those further educations, 85% of those higher educations, um, and in 32% of businesses relating to those educational. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, relating to those education sector um, schools. Just to finish off, and this will be the last slide, because I did want to try and give some time for some questions, because I'm sure many people on the call have. Um, just wanted to focus on charities as well, for those of you that may be on the call. Um, so obviously charities, the goal is to get the best and to give as much, much money as possible to the cause that you're raising for. Absolutely. But unfortunately, if your cyber attack isn't there, you're just a huge pot of money that attackers will go after because they'll know that you wouldn't have spent as much on the security. You may not have as good as an understanding as you, you should have because to pay for a top CISO, you're looking at six figures plus. And when you're trying to justify salaries and other bits and pieces and costs elsewhere, how can you justify that? Well, unfortunately, cyber is, you know, the key threat, again, for most organizations, and they will be the gatekeepers. Um, so just having a look at this, uh, again, this was pulled off from the government website. So 30% of UK charities identified a cyber attack in the past 12 months, with 87% of these charities reporting phishing attempts. Phishing attempts is an email to look like it's coming from someone or an organization, to trick you into paying or giving away details or something like that. And 23% identified a more sophisticated attack, such as a denial of service. So that could be too much traffic to your website. So imagine Red Nose Day. You've got all the TV set up and everything like that, but a denial of service attack shuts down the switchboard to take calls and donations. It shuts down the website so you can't call to give. That would be a crucial time to have a massive attack against that organization. Um, and if hackers were to say, well, let's charge a million pound ransom because we know you're going to make 10 million pounds today, you could be at a crossroad where we might actually have to do this. We know it's morally wrong, but we can't get past this. They have access to everything. They have the ability to do it. And then you come up with the classic question, do we pay the ransom or not? And many people will stand here and especially on the call Nine out of 10 people say, absolutely not. It's wrong. It's a crime. We shouldn't do it. It's funding crime. Until I tell you that there is no other way to recover unless you pay that ransom. Backups are compromised. You can't increase your systems. We can't stop that. There is literally nothing we can do now. We can get it fixed tomorrow on Saturday, but you're not going to be able to take those donations on Friday night, prime time, TV time. Then the conversation switches. In regards to incident response, so when experiencing a cyber attack, 84% of UK charities would inform their board and 73% would conduct an impact assessment. However, only 22% of charities have a written incident management plan, um, 
we've finding suggesting that an informal approach and resilience uh, on internal expertise or external business partnerships such as IT providers. You do not want to be in that boat where you are phoning around saying, what do we do? And when you phone up the third party legal firms and PR firms, they don't care who you are, that rate will double, triple, quadruple, even more because they will be like, well, you want us to drop everything we're doing right now to help you with this? Okay, the rates are going to be higher. So looking at retainers and putting them in place early with agreed rates and uh, agreeing hours, if you're paying an upfront amount, very, very important for your business continuity plan. Then just to finish, vulnerability management. So 68% of UK charities have up-to-date anti-malware protection. 23% of uh, have a patch management policy. So that's updating to make sure everything's refreshed. So only one in four. And again, remember, as soon as they become out of date, they are vulnerable because the reason why the insurer, uh, the reason why the manufacturers have updated them is because they found a flaw and they realize something's wrong. 27% of UK charities have used security monitoring tools. Please, <laughs> please use security monitoring tools. Uh, and 14% undertook a vulnerability audit and 10% use threat intelligence. Very low numbers, exactly what I thought at the beginning of this slide. Um, so it is important that you do more. Um, but whether that's relying on your insurance partner, such as yourself, whether that's your IT outsource service provider, whether that's somebody else as well, please do reach out and have these open conversations. There, there is free consultation available. If you do have insurance policies, a lot of them are giving away these type of services for free now or heavily discounted. So please do just reach out, have these conversations, uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to find some extra help and assistance that won't cost you an arm and a leg. So, but that's everything from me for the moment. As I said, I, I thought I would open up to any questions today, so... Thank you so much. I just check out the chat. Oh, and we don't have any questions. Right. Sorry. Can I, can I, can you hear oh, me? Oh. Well, not from me. I don't know if anyone in the chat can hear. Oh, no, it's me. Sorry. Can you hear me? Somehow mine went on mute. I apologize. My volume. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So I was just saying, thank you so much for all the information provided. I found it very interesting and I can't believe how clever um, hackers are getting with, you know, with all the approach to the business. And I checked out the chat, we don't have any questions, but if you don't mind, I have two. So um, in 2022, we have seen a lot of increases in premiums, like anything between 20 to 400 percent on cyber combat. Yep. And uh, you said that some very important at the beginning of the session, you said a computer is not a threat to the people. Yes. And uh, following on from the COVID, we have all flexible arrangements around working from home. And, you know, a lot of implementation has been put in place. But can you tell us now, customers, what is the price point to you? You know, insurers, are they really looking to take that risk on board? What information are they looking for? How do we get the right information? Sector. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no problem at all. So you're absolutely right. We did see those increases. Um, the good news is this year is that premiums have started to level out. Or, well, some clients have seen savings up to 10%. Some clients have seen savings up to 40%. That's because the rates now reach in equilibrium. They will never be what they were previously, but we know now we have a better idea now of what those premiums should be. Um, and for those clients that are saving more, it's generally because they've had the biggest improvement in their controls overall. Um, and it is my favorite conversation when a client says, right, they get a quotation through for £2 million and they say £180,000. That's just, that's a lot of money. The question is, again, back to the FD, what have you got provisioned for a cyber loss tomorrow? Nothing. So if you had to pay £2 million looking at your books, would you be able to achieve that over the next you know, three, six months, a year, you know, have you made that balance? No. And quantifying the risk of what you've touched on at the end there is really important. So we have an approach at Aon called the Cyber Impact Analysis, but there are other organizations and firms out there that also do that. But it is a huge piece of work. But it's really interesting because in order for boards and trustees to make informed decisions, they need the evidence. 
But what we found so far in most boards, and this is across all sectors, is that actually they haven't done any quantification piece. The heads have been in the sand to a degree. Some have deliberately, some haven't because they just don't know where to start on this. But how on earth do you make an informed decision? So saying 180,000 sounds like a lot of money. It absolutely is, especially if it's a cost you've never done. But if it's for five million, two million or five million pounds cover, that's a significant saving. And we have actually started to see uh, claims in the US on the directors and officers or trustees liability insurance, where directors start pointing fingers and say, well, actually, you said we only needed five million pounds cover or 10 million pounds cover. And we're now sitting there at a loss. A Civica would be a great example. Not that I know that this happens, but let's take that as an example. So when they first had that cyber attack, in the news, they were reporting that it's going to be an estimated 10 million loss. Currently, the last report that I read in September is at 25 million. So if their board was sitting there saying, yeah, five, 10 million pounds insurance will be enough. Now we're looking at 25 million. That's 15, millions off, 15 million off the balance sheet. And how is that affecting EBITDA? All of a sudden, all those conversations turn around and the finger pointing starts and the trust as well, because the trustees would go, well, we trusted your word. We, we thought you knew what you were talking about. Oh, no. Well, I just thought it was. So quantification is very important. Understanding what it could cost. Um, I will share with you all a data breach report made by the IBM. Um, fantastic. I read it every year. I'm a nerd. I told you that. <laughs> um, but. So the average cost is $4.47 million, and that's for a data breach up to 100,000 records. But most of you, if you have a data breach on your full database, it will be for millions of records, and those costs will run in the millions. You know, So I think it ranges from 3 to 10 million, 4, 1 to 10 million records that are breached. But you'll see for the mega breaches that are above the 10 million, the difference is in price as well. But I will send that report around as well so you can all have a read. Um, but obviously, there are other threats, ransomware. So there are other reports online. But without sitting down and quantifying it properly, you don't know whether transferring the risk is the right thing to do or not. Brilliant. We, we just, just have, have a question, question from one of our customers. For a contract for a data backup system, do both parties require cyber insurance, i.e. supply and buy it? So... My answer would be yes, and there's there's two points to think about on this. When your backup is kept off site, they are responsible for keeping that system up and running. And there is, a, I'll share the link. There was a really good story in Sweden. Um, a data center went down. They didn't have cyber insurance, and effectively they've gone under. And their backup procedure was so poor that actually all of the clients lost their data, their websites and everything else. There was 700 odd clients that were affected. Um, they said that they wouldn't pay the ransom, even if they could afford it. Now, insurers will reimburse ransoms if they need to be paid. They would have done in this instance, but it shows that that, that individual firm didn't have cyber insurance. Um, so they've effectively lost everything. But what you should be checking when you use these third parties is, do they have a business continuity plan? Is it tested? What happens if something goes wrong? Insurance is great because it will cover all of those services and you'll feel a lot more reassured um, and comfort around that piece. And then the second point of this is, does the individual who's contracting to that third party, do they need cyber? Well, from a data protection perspective, you have um, the data processor uh, and the data controller. The data controller collects and looks after that data is ultimately responsible. The processor just does what it's told, but responsible, uh, but the controller is responsible in the end. If there is a data breach resulting to that third party and that data is leaked and stolen, the data controller who originally took out that contract still has to notify all of those individuals. So what you want is a harmony between both business continuity plans or both insurances. The data center will be going, We'll find out what went wrong. We'll get back up and running as soon as possible so you can continue to trade. And then your cyber insurance will be there to go, okay, we need to notify these individuals. We need legal uh, because we still need to work with the ICO. We need PR because we need to notify those individuals and other partners we work with that there has been a breach or a compromise. Um, so that's the way the two insurances would dovetail uh, on that piece. Brilliant. 
brilliant. Thank you. And can I just ask for your opinion? Because we were all the public sector national standards. In the last couple of years, we have not seen many uh, cyber cover requests. Do you see any changes in the sort of behaviors or do they still require a lot of education from your point of view? I think there's a, a lot of education. And in it, uh, going back to one of those slides, how are you managing your third parties? So if you check Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and a lot of the other big cloud providers, look at their limitation of liability under contract, and it's nothing. They're not liable to you. They don't care. That it's just one of those things. If you've written hold harmless agreements are in place, limited liability, the best you'll get or the best you'll argue for is limited liability to the contractual value. Well, if you're only paying them 100 grand a year, that's the maximum you're going to get paid out. So you really have that issue. Um, the second thing to think about is, are you actually asking them what security they have in place? And if their security is really poor, they could definitely be a vulnerability to you. Uh, and that's going to cause a whole issue in itself. And then the third thing is, how are they connecting into your organization? Do you have things like MFA in place to stop anyone with those credentials just coming in? There was a great example, uh, Capital One, uh, where an Amazon employee took advantage of understanding how the cloud environment and Capital One's banking system worked. Effectively, Capital One was passing everything into Amazon, but there was no firewall to stop Amazon coming back. And the hacker got away with 100 million records. And that was because people misunderstand the configuration and security. They just think it's in the cloud. It's with Microsoft. It's all secure. It's not. You still have to treat it as if it's on premises. And there's a lot of misconception around that. And the most important thing with the third party as well, business continuity plans. Are they written? Are they tested? Mm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I've seen a lot of articles, and I attended one of the conferences a few weeks ago. There is a lot of questions about artificial intelligence. So my question is, how would it fit within the cyber landscape? Is it something that insurers uh, will be afraid of? Is there any answer to the question asked? I know it's very broad, but you have to get an understanding on what's going to happen in the market. Well, funny enough, and I will share my screen, I was just sharing an article this morning called Worm GPT. Let me just share my screen with you. Um, I've just got it up. Where is it? Right. So um, AI, fantastic, will help us. Elon Musk believes none of us will need a job and everything else, which, you know, I guess that is the goal. Um, but obviously people will always use it for bad things as well. So here uh, it actually says Worm GPT is an AI module um, that's been put together. It's an open source language model um, and it can be used by hackers to um, carry out modify source code, carry out attacks, ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. And the, from an insurance point of view, AI is a tool. It's no different from a person carrying out social engineering or anything else. It's a tool that will lead to the end cause of it being a ransomware or a malware. So at the moment, we're not necessarily worried about that. What it will allow people to do is carry out more attacks very easily. People with no experience, they'll just be able to run this and just get it to write a code, attach it in an email, send it off. Someone annoys you, your school annoys you, put it in an email, send it off, bang, that's taken over. Um, I've always said, I was speaking to a few new universities, they said, oh, you know, what would get people to click? I said, fight at lunch. Make it look like a video clip or something like that, or I can't believe this happened. At lunch. People will be straight on that, you know, especially the younger-minded and everything else, because they'll find it just, oh, what happened, the drama, you know, straight away, double-click. Um, but what won't be excluded, so AI isn't the individual that's carrying out these attacks, and I think that's very important to say, AI isn't going after you directly. They haven't pinpointed. Um, but yeah, it's a tool at the moment. Uh, there's no concerns because it ultimately leads to one of the claim examples that we see daily. Um, but it does just make it easier and quicker to use. So we could talk about that all day. I mean, the, the other implications, you've got all the writers in Australia, the uh, authors, you've got um, the guy who wrote uh, Game of Thrones making claims like, 
how can it write a summary if it hasn't had access to this? You know, is it right? Is it wrong? All the writers guilds up in arms. You've got the music industry up in arms. Although Universal has allowed AI access to some of its catalog, which is very interesting because I don't know if any of you have used ChatGPT, but you can get it to write uh, a song about cyber in the style of Johnny Cash or whoever you want to use. And it will write it as if it's sung by him. And I've done it and I've written scripts of it and everything. Fascinating. Um, but yeah, when do we lose that independence and intellectual property it becomes a big question. It's very interesting what you said, because um, I have a few opinions within the insurance sector that there is not such a thing as AI. So it was just great to see your point, because I think personally that there is potential threat to all the sectors and all the businesses and the cost of the sums. Brilliant. Right, let me just check our chat. We don't have any more questions, so I think we will finish just here. But what I will do, I will share the slides, if you don't mind, and all the links which you will provide to our customers. Yep. And if there will be any specific questions on cyber threat, I will just pass to some of your contact details and I can ask you access. Brilliant. That's absolutely fine. And just, yeah. um, as I said, the one question to go back today, just to cause a bit of ruckus, <laughs> is, or ask the FD, but it, it's not out of a place of saying they haven't done their job. It's not out of a place of this. It's, you know, what provision have we got on the balance sheet if a cyber attack occurs tomorrow? How will we financially look after that? How can we cope? And if the FD gets defensive, just say, look, it's just an open question. And if you're not, if you haven't got an answer, or you're not ready or prepared for it, what are the board advised or what the trustees talking about? And if the trustees and board aren't talking about it, we need to make them aware so we can help them. Absolutely. I agree. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye.